it's the next level. Hey, my name is Ross Marquon and I play Red Skull. You are listening to Panels to Pixels podcast. Check it out. Out of nowhere you send word to meet you. All this time I thought you were dead. I told you last time I was in Sintra that I wasn't coming back. Yet here you are. Hmm. Why? You've come for your child of surprise, haven't you? The opposite. I want you to tell me that he's safe and healthy so I can keep on riding. He is a girl. panelers welcome back to the show i'm mark and i'm steve and you know mark every week we get a little closer to that big 100 that's kind of how numbering works so yeah <laughs> big time we're only what after this will be eight, eight episodes eight away. seven eight depending on how you count the zero <laughs> you know <laughs> i guess 100 is a number so yeah so yeah something definitely like that. but we're getting there it's it's getting close i'm excited yeah definitely and before we actually get into our episode we should really listen to the feedback that we got this week yeah let's do it so we got a a little feedback from lyra and she talks about last episode as well as this one so that will give us food for thought while we're talking about our top fives hi there steve and mark here is a quick review of what i thought of witcher episode six rare species I really enjoyed this episode because it felt like a full-on D&D quest. A warrior, a mage, dwarves, all on a mission to kill a dragon. It was pretty cool, and it felt the most fantasy-focused episode of the series. Uh, I love the development of the romance and the bromance between Geralt and Yennefer and Geralt and Yaskier. It was so well done. They all had really (laughs) sweet one-on-one moments with each other. And then it all goes to shit when Geralt breaks up with everyone at the end of the episode. But we finally did get to hear, not in specifics, but in general, that Geralt's wish from the djinn was in some way made to tie Jennifer to him. And you know this is going to piss her off. The mage who broke away from the Brotherhood of Mages just so she, just so that she could take charge of her own destiny is now kind of changed to the White Wolf. So despite the hunkiness of Henry Cavill, someone like Yennefer is still going to want a life and a will of her own. So I completely understand why she broke things off and, and went on her own way. Also, we found out in episode six that both witches and mages, witchers, not witches, witchers and mages are all made to be sterile upon transformation. So they can't have any children and they can live this long life, but have no legacy afterwards. Uh, I guess that's one of Yennefer's major (laughs) hangups about being a mage. Best line from episode six, when Yaskier finds the Hirika, Hirika in the bushes and runs out saying, Geralt! It's one of your friends again. And then we got that douchey <laughs> night. Oh, I wasn't happier. I've never been happier Same for here. someone to uh, get killed while taking a shite in the forest. <laughs> On to episode seven, Before a Fall. What do you guys think of these episode titles? They're so great. This one was Before a Fall. Not only the fall of Sintra, but the fall of Calanthe out the window. <laughs> That's terrible. Cool switch of POV, though, in this episode. You get to see basically the (laughs) first episode (laughs) all over again, but this time through Geralt's eyes. That was pretty interesting that Siri looks up from her game of knuckle bones with the the kids in in the village. You see it in the first episode, and you don't realize what she's actually looking at is that is Geralt looking at her. So he was there the whole time. It's a little bit of a mind blow there that we find out he's he was actually <laughs> in Sintra the whole time and we just never saw him. One thing I wondered about yep. and I wonder if we'll see in season two more backstory with Duni and Pavetta. You hear that they are killed in a shipwreck and that's why Siri becomes orphaned. But 
Pavetta obviously had a ton of power, so do you think maybe she was taken prisoner? Because I don't think someone with that much power can be easily killed in a shipwreck. Anyhow, I really liked the reveal of Eratusa and the politics going on behind it. Apparently, they have their own celebrity admission scandal there. People paying to get their <laughs> daughters into Eratusa who have absolutely no talent <laughs> at all. And R.I.P. Queen Calanthe. She definitely had her issues, you, you know, like a, the genocide of the whole elven race. But, man, she was an interesting character. But, you know, how many times did she think she could defy the law of surprise and not have to pay for it? That's too bad. I'll miss her character. She was horrible, but also kind of a badass bitch. Mm -hmm. And what an ending <laughs> when Siri finally does something other than just wander around in the forest lost. She unleashes the full-on powers of the Dark Phoenix on her attackers when she, they um, tried to take her to the Nilf Guardians. My favorite line of the episode... Have you ever used that word before? Was uh, Yennefer's mm. sick burn to her professor who <laughs> says, please come help us. Anyhow, that's my quick review of the last two episodes. And I can't wait to hear what you guys think. Bye. Yeah, I actually I had that in my notes about the, the fake Siri and seeing that scene with the real Siri playing. I actually went back to episode one and watched the scene play out again and the it's a little bit I, I, I'm gonna have to criticize them just a little bit because they should have if they really wanted us to believe that the scene we're seeing here in episode seven is the same scene that we're seeing in episode one, we should have seen the girl curtsy to Siri and say and call her princess. We didn't see that in in episode one. All we saw was her throwing the bones and then looking at the empty doorway. And so there's a little bit of a it's a little bit of a cheat, I think, in my opinion, by the by the film the the showrunners to not include that part of the scene in episode one because maybe they thought it would be too much of a giveaway that there was some kind of a switch going on, but it just that that was it felt like a cheat to me that they didn't include that. And I wanted to go back and rewatch episode one to be sure we didn't see that girl do her little curtsy bow thing, and we don't in episode one. Yeah, I agree. Definitely. That that was a that was pretty much a giveaway. Yeah, it, it it might have been kind of a giveaway that there was something more going on with this this girl, but I I don't think it would have I don't think it would have taken away from the episode for us to see that. Maybe I don't know. I'm I, it's just it was a, a different little, perspective too at that point. So maybe Yeah, it's just a little it's just a little criticism. I think we we should have seen that part. But yeah. Yeah. I, it feels like a cheat to me, but that's okay. <laughs> And uh, I like her thing about the episode titles. I hadn't thought about it. Yeah. So yeah. now I, I may have to go back and look at the episode titles again and see how some of them kind of match up to what's going on in the episode. Yeah, definitely. And with that, uh, the synopsis for episode seven, Before a Fall, with the continent at risk from Nilfgaard's rising power, Yennefer revisits her past while Geralt reconsiders his obligation to the Law of Surprise. Yeah, this was a good episode seeing a different perspective on episode one, seeing some of the same scenes and now understanding what they mean, like when Mausak bursts into the room and says mm. he's gone. That was in episode one, but we had no clue who he was talking about at the yeah. time. You know, so so it was kind of a cool little thing there that we, we got to see that. We get to see Geralt watch the queen die and so we understand now why he was on the whole other side of the parapet the castle whatever when siri and her knight went out the back door you know hmm. so it's it which is which is kind of a cool little thing for us to realize that oh okay that's why he went looking for her and that's why he couldn't find her because they missed each other so yeah that kind of stuff is is really cool yeah definitely and we should get into our top five <laughs> don't judge me yeah, I think uh, I think I started last week, so I think it's your turn. Sure. Uh, my number five would be seeing Siri in the beginning, trying to get away uh, a way out with someone, you know, just to get away from everything. Uh, the words she used to describe her current situation was very proper to one of the locals that were there. 
Yeah, that's the the line when she says it was really cool when the local woman says it's it's in fact it's my it's my only quote from the show so I'm just going to share it here. It's when the the woman says this place isn't safe for if you're alone and Siri replies then it's the same as any other place. Exactly. Uh, realizing that she's realized that she's she's in trouble no matter where she where she goes. So which we get uh, we get another indication of that at the end of the episode when when those guys try to kidnap her, but just to correct Lord Lars' voicemail a little bit, we don't actually see what she does to those guys until the next episode. Yeah, definitely. So we we do see her with the whole speaking those words, and uh, but uh, so Siri was kind of my number five as well, and we see some of the things she's doing now that we're in this present timeline. She she steals uh, she tries to steal some bread, she steals the horse. And then, of course, the scene at the end where she's talking to the horse, I thought was great. And she says something like, well, who talks to a horse? So I thought it was really cool because that, that kind of mirrored what Geralt does when he talks to, to his horse. But but yeah, Siri in this episode, we got to learn a lot about her. The only other question I have is she looks like she's older than 12. Oh, definitely. But Geralt, but Geralt says he's been gone 12 years. Mm hmm so that would put her at like 11 because she was just, you know, she had just been, born. they had just discovered. Yeah, she hadn't been born yet when he was there. Yeah. She was, you know, so that would make her like 11 and she does, doesn't look 11 to me. So I think that, that but, you know, they, they had to get a, a girl that could, could do the acting and stuff. And so that's, but I'm okay with that. Yeah, same here. Plus a lot of girls grow up faster than most boys. It's, it's true. Older. So, yeah, it's yeah. true. So she could, she could be 11, 12. Okay. Yeah. My number four would be, and you could tell me if I'm wrong on this, but Pavetic proclaimed that Siri is the Witcher's quote unquote child surprise. Uh, I honestly thought it was within his loins. <laughs> he he comes back within this time jump backwards. I, I thought it was interesting to see that particular conversation because all the all along I thought when we were looking at the uh, previous episodes when he tells Yennefer about his child surprise I thought well the fact that he's able to conceive something with someone right yeah no I don't think that's what I think it was you're talking about Kalinthe because we didn't see we didn't actually see Pavetta in this episode Pavetta is the mother yeah was that's the what child, I meant was yeah the series yeah. mother yeah. so you meant Kalinthe yeah. yeah yeah well and because it, in Kalinthe's mind that's the way she thought of it. She thought of that's the what what the child of surprise was. It is his. It's not his by blood, mm. but it's his by destiny. So when she says you're here to claim your child, that's what that's what she means. I think she doesn't mean that it's actually like his child. That's what I that, I was taking it verbatim. Per right. Se. Yeah. I I don't think that's what she meant. She okay. was just acknowledging. And then of course, but it, it's it's one of those things that that he's done it's it's the only thing it's another one of those character plot points kind of developments that we that i don't think we get a clear reason why he comes back i understand that he comes back because everybody is telling him that his child of surprise is in danger mm -hmm. and he needs to go get her but all through the series we've seen him saying no he doesn't want anything to do with it and then all of a sudden there's this turnaround in this episode when we sync up the timelines where he's going there to protect the child. So I, I maybe maybe there was something in the previous six episodes that shows that development, and I just overlooked it. Yeah, we, or it's a possibility. You know, there's there's so much going on within this show. Yeah, and, and back and forth. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> you know? Yeah, maybe that conversation with Jennifer in the last episode about the fact that 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 she's explaining to him how she wants to have a child and can't have a child and he has a child and doesn't want it. Maybe that was what was meant to show us his development of suddenly deciding that he wants to go protect Siri. Hmm. Uh, or to protect the child. So, I thought that was really interesting. I thought it was it was kind of cool that he didn't know the child was a girl. Because he tells Mausak at the beginning, well, just show me the boy, show me that he's safe, and I'll go. And then Mausak <laughs> tells him, no, it's a, it's a princess, it's a she. So, so that's, that's kind of interesting. And then just his whole idea of, of wanting to protect the child and Kalinthe not wanting him to have the child. And, of course, they have that conversation once he discovers that the girl they're trying to give him is not Siri. And he, he says, you're talking about a mother's love when you're trying to give away another mother's child exactly you know yeah. that's that duality that was within kalinthe was she had this love for her family but everybody else it's like if you're not 
if you're not of me, if you're not in my circle, whatever, I don't care about you. And I think that's what, what the Clint they what makes the Clint they character so cool and so fun to to watch this season is because we do have that duality. We have that woman who's walking into court yelling beer and you know and, and suffering through all these court things that she doesn't like, but then she wants to protect uh, her granddaughter. So and and you know uh, the King of Skellum. The grand, the other, the guy she married in that episode four or five, whichever one it was, he did, he originally wasn't going to deny the law of surprise. That's what Geralt tells him. And then he says, well, everything changed when I had a granddaughter. Everything uh, changed when suddenly there was this, this person that I had to protect and I didn't want anybody else to protect her. I thought that was a really cool, quick little scene that we see, you know, before he locks up Geralt. So. Mm, definitely. Uh, so my number four is just the, the the fact that we've already talked a little bit about it that uh, we get, we're syncing up our timelines now and so because we're seeing the fall of Centro which we saw in the very first episode uh, but like Laura pointed out we see it from Geralt's point of view he meets with the real Mausak there at the beginning and they they fight uh, or they kind of fight but Mausak uh, portals them out of there so uh, so yeah that just the, the fact that we finally synced up our timelines we're not going to be time hopping anymore i think episode eight is i think if i remember correctly is just the whole straightforward the rest of the battle with nilfgaard and what happens there so so it's kind of cool that we've synced up our timelines oh definitely my number three would be uh the scene with istrid and yennefer there is a lot of tension there but he rejects her and it just left me going what <laughs> why but I, he had a lot of things to say within the actual scene to justify it. Yeah, this was my number three as well, and it was a little confusing. Maybe it was just it was just a way for us to stop worrying about. His, I mean, frankly, I had forgotten about his character. Until, <laughs> Everybody does, <laughs> you know. Uh, I had completely forgotten about his character, so there really didn't. I don't think it was necessary to show it, but it does give us a development of Yennefer showing that she made this attempt. You know, to, to be with get, somebody else at that point. Yeah, to be yeah. with somebody else besides Geralt. And now you're wondering, well, did he, did, and now I'm starting to wonder, did Istrid really make that choice? Or was that part of the, wish. the whole, yeah, the wish that he's not going <laughs> to say yes to it because he can't. And he doesn't even realize he can't, you know. And that would have been an interesting argument from Yennefer to, to tell him, well, you know, fight this and see what happens. But I don't think it would have worked, so. You you were enchanted. That's all she had to say. And yeah, she could have tried. Yeah, and then they are both part of the sorcery. Yeah, and yeah, you know, and witches and stuff like that. Yeah, it would so have been you would interesting. Think they would be able to do something. Yeah, and that little meeting she has with the other the other mage, who's who's like, well, we both have fake safe conduct letters, and we're gonna get found out. But she doesn't go with him or no she does go with him to Eratusa. he's the one that takes her to to Eratusa. that conversation was kind of interesting yeah there as well because he he definitely recognizes her and knows who she is but we don't realize that until they get to Eratusa and he says well you know i went there look so so basically the, the understanding i have is that they knew that eventually she would get go back to istrid is what i'm thinking and so the guy was basically just waiting there for her to show <laughs> up you know <laughs> But I thought that was interesting. Yeah, yeah, it was really cool. So I think that brings us to your number two, because my number three was the same thing. Oh, okay. That would be finding out that not only is Yennefer sterile, but so are the students of sorcery within the little uh, guild that she was part of. Yeah, I thought that was, a, it was at first when, and I'm glad you, you bring this up because I was a little confused why, as the audience, we had to hear this, because we've already heard Geralt say that they're sterile and that they're made sterile. So there really wasn't necessary, but I guess it, it does. Again, it shows Yennefer's character that she's telling these girls, here's, you've got two consequences. If you don't ascend, you're going to become one of these eels. And if you do ascend, you can't have a child. So here's your choices. Those are your two choices if you stay here. And, yeah. and that's basically what she's telling them. And I don't think they get it. But nope. uh, <laughs> they don't. Yeah. At all. Yeah. But yeah, that whole that whole drug scene with the girls is my is my number two. And I thought it was it was really kind of kind of interesting. Some of them were talking about, you know, they're saying that they can see the ceiling and the one girl thought she was floating and yep. uh, all these these kind of weird high. But then they come out of it pretty quick when when Yennefer tells them, you know, that they uh, 
Yeah, the, the high just didn't last very long when she finds out when she finds out that they were that their family had paid for at least one of them to be there and they had no kind of magical talent whatsoever. And so that's a really really cool thing to hear is that that maybe part of the herbs was a spell that she was working on. Maybe it wasn't just the herbs because she breaks it so quickly there. I don't know. Yeah. But then of course, and, say, and it uh, doesn't last so long. So basically she got some really bad weed Yeah, yeah. and she couldn't really get them under or bad acid yeah. at that point, you know, and that way they, they were an under the spell kind of get leaves you to that whole lottery thought in the movie dragon slayer mm-hmm. when they pull lots to send out a uh, virgin to be, used as a sacrifice to the dragon and then in this case it was like a bunch of lots just for x amount of girls to go in to go into this whole coven of sorcery or or this guild as it were yeah yeah that they were just it was just all paid money by their their family so yeah and they weren't chosen in any some sort of way whereas if you look at yennefer she had the wanting of it herself Mm -hmm. and was offered that by uh i think tessia is her name uh the one who brought her in oh you mean you mean to stay there to to stay there and and yeah that's again that was another confusing and and be a teacher there or something like that that was another confusing kind of scene because in one breath you know to say is asking her we'll stay here and we'll both run Eratusa. And then in the next breath, they're having this big meeting where they're trying to decide if they're going to go help Sintra or not. So it was, yeah. that was a, it was a little confusing to me, the position that Tesea was in. It's almost like, I wonder if she, she didn't, ex- she expected the council of mages to just go, yes, we're going to go help Sintra. And she was, yeah. I think she was surprised to find out that they, they're against it. Yeah. That they yeah. all voted to no. And, and of course we see a uh, St- Stigabor, St- Stigab- the guy from uh, episode one again, and mm-hmm. um, and all that. So, okay, where are we? To your number two. I did my number two was the was talking about the drugs thing. So we're to your number one. My number one would be Yennefer going with Tessia. I, yeah, I'm I'm assuming that's how you say her name. Yeah, the head of the academy, as it were, that brought in Yennefer in the very beginning. But for the fight of the Academy against Sintra. Yeah, again, that's another one of those things that, that uh, we're going to see that play out in the next in the next episode. I don't think we actually, we, well, we see her agree to go with her, and we're actually yeah. going to see the fight. And, and this was my number one as well, was just the fact that, that, that she, because Tessia, to see, however you say her name, uh, <laughs> used the word please. And, and that was what, what convinced Yennefer, what changed her mind. Because remember, Yennefer was in, was in with the council going, pfft. Just let Sintra die. I don't care. Burn it all down. Because really, for Yennefer, that's her thing. Her thing is, obviously, the way we're going is not working. So let's just burn it all down and start over again. And, exactly. And uh, that's, you can't really, that, that's not a that's not a, a good way to, to do things. We can't really, we've got to work within with what we've got. So, yeah. Uh, you can't throw anarchy out there and then just start from the piles of rubble and everything and start over. You yeah. have to choose a side in some way. And whatever makes sense for the majority, exactly, not the minority, exactly. Yep. Yeah, you got to got to choose a side. So uh, I already gave my quote. So go ahead and give your quote, and then we'll look at our notes. My one quote would be, "The lady in the market area to Siri. She says, how about this? And when we'll make room on on a clip clop and be home by dark? Clip and clop have the horses. That's the names of the horses. Clip and clop. Yeah, I know." <laughs> And, and we don't have much, but we've got a site more than you do. Roof, food, space, on the floor to sleep. And a lot is happening in the, in this content. Co- uh, continent, I should say. But we're safer th- when we stick together. Okay? And grand. And it was very sincere for her to say those things to her from the woman, but... Uh, you know, someone reaching out to someone with a need, but Siri was on her own path at that point, regardless of whoever was going to help. She was on some sort of destined mission for herself. Mm-hmm. But the the sincerity within, you know, the words that she was speaking, and obviously I'm not giving it any good <laughs> <laughs> No, that's okay, wording. but it's a, it's a good... It wasn't... At first, I kind of was confused about why... 
because I, I couldn't remember exactly what happened with this scene. And so it is good, though, that we get this sincere because we haven't seen a lot of that. Even the rat boy elf who turns on her is, you know, you think he's he's going to help her. Mm. And then the guys at the end, you think they're going to help her, but they don't. I think this woman really was sincere, like you said. I think she really wanted to just, just give her some protection for the night. But Siri knew she couldn't stop there. She She had to keep going. She was trying to get to... Again, this is one of those things where you have to pick it up throughout the series. She was trying to get to Skelgard, where her the, that was the kingdom of her grandfather. Remember the, the guy with the ships who came, the one who said... So that's where she was trying to get to, because she says, how long would it take you to get to yes. Skelgardia or whatever? And the guy's like, well, on a fast horse, it would be this long. And she's like, well, how long if you're walking? And he just laughs at her. So... Uh, so she had a plan that she was going to try to get somewhere. And what bothers me a little bit is it's not until the next episode, I think, that we have her actually start asking people about Geralt the Witcher. You know, I think I, if I remember correctly, I think in the next episode, there's a few places where she mm. stops and she tries because she, she, she realizes that's who she needs to find. And so, yeah, it's a little bit of a, again, it's another one of those kind of maybe a misdirect kind of thing here that we haven't heard her mention. Well, except for when she's talking to Mausak, the fake Mausak a couple episodes ago, that she talks about Geralt. But in this episode, she didn't mention Geralt at all. She just is like stealing a horse and trying to get out of there. Hmm. And I, that scene when she's talking to the horse and she's like, you know, are you Clip or are you Clop? I don't know. So the only other note I have, we already talked about the fake Siri. And we already really talked about a little bit of the, the Northern Mages Council, but I did find it interesting that Frangilla, and I, this is another thing I don't remember from the last episode, if they, but Frangilla claims that once they take Sintra, that's, they're going to stop. Nilfgaard's not going to try to take the rest of the continent because that's the concern that Tesea has. Tesea is like, well, if they, if they take Sintra, then they're going to take Sodden. And if they take Sodden, then they're going to take the whole Northern continent kind of thing. And, and that's where her concern is. But Frangilla says, no, they're going to stop at Sintra because of the sins that Sintra has, has had or whatever. She has that whole, Frangilla has that whole speech about there's no black magic, there's no white magic or good magic. It's all just magic. So, hmm. yeah. That's pretty cool, though. I didn't. And I, I had to agree with you with the, uh, the whole fake Siri thing. That was a scene that was needed, though. But it gave a little bit of clarity of what was going yeah. on. Yeah, it helped us understand yeah. a little bit of of what was going on and and the reaction of the boys and that kind of stuff to her. And and again, that's one of those things that we see those same characters at the end of the episode when they're trying to kidnap Siri. So I thought that was that was kind of cool to get that. Would they say, "Well, we used to have to let you win at knuckle bones or something like that"? I didn't even try to count the hums this week, so. <laughs> Well, the feedback we got was basically from Lara this week, so we played that at the very beginning, so she gave a little bit of last week's and this cool. week's. So, And as far as a whole with the show, I'm still continuing to watch, and I'm enjoying it still just oh, the yeah. same. Oh, I can't, yeah, I can't wait to I can't wait to wrap this up and for us to figure out what we're going to do <laughs> after. <laughs> yeah, next. There's some things that we can look at, I think, and, and, and talk about. But. All right. Well, with Comic Talk, I only have a little bit of news that's in a positive light. Katie Sackhoff is in The Mandalorian. Oh. Now, as the character that she voiced in the actual Clone Wars show, huh. which was Bo-Katan. So now she's going to not only be the voice, but she's going to play it physically within the show. That's kind of cool. I, that might be a, a consideration. I mean, we both have Disney+, Plus, right? So we could do Clone Wars. And there's a yeah. lot of episodes of Clone Wars. That would be because it's several seasons, right? And it just wrapped. Oh, it just wrapped up. Oh, it just wrapped up. Yeah. I watched it. If listeners, if you have not seen the Clone Wars, I stopped at season three. But for me to, I just kind of bypassed all the other seasons after that oh. and just watched the last four of this last season. Okay. And the last four episodes of this past season were amazing. There's a an awesome fight scene with Darth Maul and you have to watch it because they actually did motion capture with Ray Park who played Darth Maul in the Phantom Menace and he reprises his role doing the motion capture lightsaber duel with uh, uh Ahsoka. Very cool. 
I have not watched Clone really Wars cool. at all, so it's I haven't watched it at all. So I'm I think I tried to start it one time and just wasn't able to get into it, but it might be something to consider. So Well, for the fact that, you know, not only we got Rosaria Dawson as Ahsoka, uh what is it? Yeah, to me Olivan is something. They is they haven't be announced on what he's going to be yet. Some people have speculation, but I that's just speculation of what character he's gonna play. Yeah, and now we have like a stated, you know, Katie Sackoff. Yeah, I hadn't heard about 10. her, so that's very cool. So so uh, we we have a few podcasts. Yeah, I've got uh, I've got two real quick that I want to that I want to mention. I've been uh, rewatching Scrubs. There's a Scrubs rewatch podcast called Fake Doctors, Real Friends with Zach and Donald. That's with Zach Braff and Donald Faison. They it's a wonderfully fun and, and just it's a kind of a slow rewatch, so you don't have to. They're only about an hour or so, and they're really good. These guys are you can tell these guys are really good friends. And that they just, uh, they click so well and they've, they've gotten in the first few episodes, they've gotten Bill Lawrence in there to interview. They've gotten Johnny C. McGinley in there. They had Sarah Chalk. And so they're, they're really, uh, getting their, their, their other stars involved and it's really, really good. And then as a special note, I am going to be guesting with Rima on uh, strange indeed this coming next week, we'll be covering Gerald's game, the Netflix movie. And, uh, so if you, don't tune into Strange Indeed. Look for them. They're on Podcastica. Just search for Strange Indeed in any of your podcast players and you'll find it. But uh, I will be on there next week. Awesome. Definitely. I intend on listening. That is amazing. You are branching out. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> on TV Podcast Industries, I'll give them another plug because they gave us a really nice plug at the end of one of their last ones. So TV Podcast Industries is another good uh, podcast to check out. They're doing Penny Dreadful City of Angels right now. And the only one I'm going to offer up this week would be Lost, We Have to Go Back. And that's with Kristen and Ben on the Next Level Podcast Network. Yes. And for YouTube recommendations, I would say the Grim Life Collective. I always pitch them every week or every other week. They do a late night watch. So with everything that's going on in this world... On the weekend, if you have nothing better to do, grab your popcorn, grab your beer, grab whatever drink you prefer, get your red vines. Who knows? <laughs> I, I grab red vines and Angry Orchard when I watch the shows with them. So they do an up all night on Saturday nights, and they usually start their podcast, or not podcast, but YouTube, at 1130, which is a preempt till the midnight hour when they start the movie. So you'll need two players at this point so if you have an apple tv tune in your apple tv to the actual youtube channel that they have and play the movie from there that they upload and then use your computer which would be best unless you're able to make comments through youtube when they do their own commentary so that way you could be part of what's going on they kind of do like an elvira up all night and it's pretty cool to do because you just hang out with some friends because at this time, we're not able to hang out with anybody physically. You know, some of us are so far away. Michael and Jessica are in Florida. I'm up in New York. Steve's out in Oklahoma. And, you know, we, we could all just hang out virtually and just talk about these things. And it's amazing to do that. So as we're recording this tonight... You guys won't see it, but you could do it on your own. You could actually listen to their commentary separately as if you're, you know, they're live. But I always suggest that you tune in on Saturday nights at 1130 when they start it this week. You could actually rewatch it during the week when they have the movie still there on their YouTube page as well as their commentary and just sync it up perfectly and you know, they're doing The Stand by Stephen King. They're doing the whole miniseries up until the morning. So you got hours upon hours of <laughs> of a show to watch with them if you wanted to. And that I hope it engages you because sometimes we're starting to run out of things and ideas to watch. And with, uh, with Steve and I, yeah, we have The Witcher right now. We're not sure exactly what we're going to do next, but... If you guys have any suggestions of what you would want us to watch or rewatch and make a commentary, please do so and leave that feedback on our Facebook page. Absolutely. Yes, and that Facebook page is Panels to Pixels. It's facebook.com slash panels to pixels. You can find us on any of your podcast player of choice. Just we're on most of them. Just search for Panels to Pixels podcast and you'll find us. 
We also have a web page, which is panels to pixels podcast.com. We have an email address, panels to pixels one at gmail.com. That's panels to pixels one. The TO is spelled out right there in the middle and the number one at gmail.com. Or if you want to leave us an old school voicemail message, you can record yourself at 845 350 2095. Again, that's 845 350 2095. We are also on YouTube at Panels to Pixels Podcast. You can check us out there and give us a thumbs up. Awesome. And where else you could hear us and other places, listeners? I'm a co-host on The Walking Dead Talk Through with Brian Malosh and Kyle McAdams on Talk Through Media. We review The Walking Dead each week when it's on. Obviously, right now, it's not on. Nothing's really <laughs> on. So uh, this show will stay, you know, Panels to Pixels will stay on the Next Level Podcast Network. But there will always be a link for Talk Through Media or anything that's going on within Talk Through Media that includes The Walking Dead Talk Through, Fear the Walking Dead Talk Through, and Let's Talk Through, which is on the TalkThroughMedia.com page, which you can actually subscribe to if you want through Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcast clients. That would be Spotify, Stitcher, or Google Play, or iTunes. Very cool. Or it might be Apple Podcasts now. Yeah. Very cool. And as I said before, I will be guest co-hosting or being part of Strange Indeed. Next week, we'll be covering Netflix's TV movie. I guess, is it a TV movie that's on Netflix? It's a Netflix, Netflix movie, Netflix movie, Netflix movie Gerald's Game, next week. So check us out on Strange Indeed. And, of course, you can always hear me here and uh, also any other show that I happen to leave some feedback for. <laughs> and if you guys want something to listen to before our next episode... It was just recently uploaded last night. We're recording on Saturday the 16th of May. And Brian had uploaded our interview with Lindsley Register from The Walking Dead fame. She was the savior, Laura. You know, she had a tattoo on her neck, a nose piercing, and she worked with Dwight and then eventually became part of the Alexandrian Council. And we lost her this season. spoilers (laughs) spoilers <laughs> so we actually did an interview for her she has a new movie out that's now available on amazon prime or amazon and you could purchase that for 4.99 called scorn so you could either purchase scorn for four dollars and 99 cents or you could rent it for a dollar 99 so i recommend it it's not your typical genre it's a very it's it's pretty much a very dramatic film and you could tell this is drama based upon what actors like to do she was really good in it i like the actual premise and the thought and you could hear our interview with lindsley on talkthroughmedia.com you could actually see the video of it on youtube if you'd like and that you could find on the walking dead talk through on youtube so Well, that's all we have for tonight. Thanks, everybody, for listening. I'm Mark. And I'm Steve. And this was Panels to Pixels. And we'll see you on the next panel. Good night. Good night, everybody.